So you come, you come to them. Yes, Dan is my cousin, and Delcio, no, Dan is my brother. <laughs> my, my cousins are um, like Yvette and Miriam and Chester Jr. Yes, those are my cousins. So, and then I had another pastor in this conference that was also a pastor, an uncle, and he uh, passed away not long ago. So. I'm very happy to be part of the family. By the way, one day when I was seated at his, he had invited me to preach to his church. And I was seated in his house having a meal after church. He told me that he had had, when he was a young man, a photographic memory. And, and he would be able to remember things when he read, not just the words he read, but what page he read, because he can see them. He can see the picture of every page. And I'm saying, that's crazy. I wish I had that kind of memory. Um, but he was nominated more than once to be a Hispanic conference leader in the Southern Conference, but he rejected. He would have been actually placed there if he would have not rejected the nomination. So. He was that kind of a man, a um, very successful pastor. And by the way, we too as Christians, we can be successful as well. And that's what we're talking about today. Abounding in all grace. How in the world can we be successful? Well, let's read the, the Bible. If you want to read with me, there it is on the screen. It says 2 Corinthians 9, 8, And God is able to make all grace abound in you, that you, always, having all you need in all things, you may abound to every good work. Successful Christian is such because of the grace of God. And the grace of God abounds. It's greater than anything at all. There was this minister who was thinking about quitting. And I'll tell you two, two of them. This one in particular, you may remember him from history. He was so discouraged because, I mean, he felt he was a failure. He didn't feel like he was abounding at all. And so, when he was pondering, all of a sudden, a scripture comes to mind. And that's the way God talks. And the scripture was about Romans chapter 8. And it's talking about the Spirit. And it's talking about how to have victory. This guy, he decides to accept an invitation that they're going to have some reading. This one lay guy, he's not a pastor, he's just one of you guys, basically. He is reading Martin Luther's introduction to the book of Romans, and all of a sudden he feels something warm in his heart. Because he felt like that was what was missing in his life, in his ministry. And that's why he wasn't successful. And finally, finally, after several years of being a minister, he accepts Jesus. He was born again. Amen. And he began abounding in grace. Do you know who I'm talking about? His name is John Wesley. Now, this other guy, you may not know him, but he's a Seventh-day Adventist. And he was my professor for one of the classes of Andrews University. He was also contemplating in quitting his ministry. And what was wrong with him? Well, he got this one church, and the church had been decimated, so instead of having 120 members, it only had like 60 members when he got there. And his plan was to work hard to build it up and to make it grow. But after like two years, instead of there being like 
more than 60, there was less than 60, there was like 30 people, half of them, <laughs> half of them left. And this guy, he was really discouraged and he was writing a letter to his conference president and his wife walks in on him and he's, she says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm writing my letter of resignation. And she says, oh no, you are not going to resign. And the guy says, well, I've tried everything. I worked so hard, I lost sleep by working and making a bunch of programs and people won't come. And she says, oh no, you find a way. So this guy decides that he's going to fast and pray. So he decides to go to church to fast and pray. So on Monday morning, there's nobody in church and he's the only one in church. He kneels down in front of the front pew and he starts praying. And he is like three minutes into his prayer and all of a sudden he fell asleep. You know, Sometimes when you try to get a better relationship with God, you get sleepy. <laughs> it just happens. I've seen people sleeping when I'm preaching. So. <laughs> but <clears throat> this guy, he sleeps for hours, actually. He needed the rest. Then when he wakes up in the afternoon, when it was time to go back home, he's thinking in his head, what am I going to tell my wife? She's going to ask me, what happened? How did it go? And he, and he told her the truth when he got home. He said, it went really well. And then in his mind, he said, for three minutes. <laughs> but he decided to do another fast again the next week. So he starts praying. And he's fasting and praying, but this time the prayer only lasted two minutes and he fell asleep again for like almost a whole day. Wow. So he decided that wasn't going to work for him. He was going to continue to fast on Mondays, but he was going to do something he had never done before. He was going to do prayer walking. And that did work. Once a week he was fasting, and he would daily be prayer walking. And his prayers just leaped and bounded like never before. All of a sudden he had a relationship with Jesus Christ that he never had before. So he was a happy man. His ministry grew and grew and grew till there were more than 120 people, and there were more and more. He wrote a book, and in his book, he is explaining step by step how to have that relationship so that your ministry can abound, to be successful. I love that guy, he was my favorite professor at um, Andrews University. You know, his name, maybe some of you guys know him, Joseph Kidder. Joseph Kidder is his name. Maybe you can look, it, look him up. When he gave us classes, I remember that he was very passionate. The way he preached was really strong. You can feel the Holy Spirit. It's because he had a special relationship with Jesus. Proclamation. Some of you guys know Spanish. I know that. So if you want to say it with me in Spanish... Let's say, I'm going to say the first line and then the bolded part, you guys can say. Quiere ser salvo de toda maldad. Quieres vivir y gozar santidad. Hay poder, sí, sin igual poder. Hay poder, sí, sin igual poder. Amen. How about in English? Let's say it all in English. 
Would you be free from the burden of sin? Would you over evil a victory win? There is power, power, wonder working power. There is power, power, wonder working power. Amen. Amen. That is the secret. Both of these men learned that it is not working hard that makes the difference. It is working hard on your relationship that makes a difference. Even if you fail by falling asleep, but you'll find a way. God will inspire you. God will lead you. And you will abound in all grace so that you can be successful. Successful as a father, successful as a husband, successful as a wife, successful as an employee, successful as a breadwinner, successful in winning your family to Christ, which is so important. And as a church, successful to grow the church. It all depends on the power, on the precious blood of the Lamb, which will give us the grace. I like this story because it has to do with proclamation. By the way, what we just did when you guys were reading with me, that is called a proclamation. And what these guys did was a proclamation as well. About two months ago, the United States pulled out of Afghanistan and there were a lot of people stuck in Afghanistan. In fact, there still are right now. One group, this, this was a Christian group, they decided to cross the, the border on their own. While they're on their way, they made a stop and somebody told you, the border you're going to is controlled by so-and-so, and these guys are murderers. They will just kill you for approaching that border. And these guys, well, they didn't want to get killed. So they parked aside and did prayers and they all voted, decided we're going to go through anyways. So they did. When they tried, they were rejected. And they said, you have no right, you have no papers, there's no permission given. So they were rejected. They had to come back. They did some more praying, and then it happened. They decided that they were going to make a proclamation. <laughs> At a distance from the border, they proclaimed in the name of Jesus that the border will open for them and they would pass. So they approached the border again for the second time. That was really bold because they knew they could have been killed. But the guys, they, they had their mouth open, couldn't believe what was happening, and they stood still as they went through the border. They were able to go through. How do you explain that? There is power in the blood. There is power in proclamation. There are many proclamations in the Bible. Here are Jesus' proclamations. He said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Has that Happen? Is that still true today? Yes. Do we still have this word? We have it in our hands, in our cell phones. We have them very readily available still to this day. The Bible is a bestseller, the bestseller worldwide. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Is that true? Absolutely. After that, Jesus made another proclamation. He says, Lazarus, come forth. That was a proclamation. What happened? Lazarus did come forth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. See? It was a spoken word that brought this world into existence. From nothing. 
How in the world can life happen by the word of God? Jesus declared a curse on a fig tree. And Jesus answered and said to it, No man eat fruit from thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And the next day they came back and they saw that the tree was withered and it dried up from the roots. And the disciples asked, How in the world did this happen? And remember what Jesus answered? Jesus answered, Matthew 21, 21. Have faith in God. You too can do this. In fact, Jesus said, if you have faith, you can make a mountain move, and you can uproot large trees and cast them into the sea. I imagine that they were fairly close to the sea when Jesus was speaking these words. It was in Jerusalem. Maybe there was a pool of water or something. I don't know. But the interesting thing is that proclamations are not just for Jesus. They are for us too. This is one of the things that gives us power to overcome. We all need to overcome in many areas. This is the whole context and we're reading in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. And basically it was saying that um, Paul is saying to the Corinthians that he sent people to collect the offerings which they had pledged. And it was going to be collected for the saints who were preaching the word of God. So it was a collection, a special collection for the, the you know, the preaching of the gospel. Every man, according as he proposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, but, or forcing himself, for God loves a cheerful giver. I'm looking for the laser pointer, if there's one here. There it is. And God is able to make all grace abound in you, that you always having all you need in all things you may abound to every good work. Every good work means conquer and be victorious over every sin. And I don't know about you, I don't claim to be perfect. I am not perfect. I was called to be men's ministry leader, not because I am perfect, but be, despite the fact I am imperfect. And God has used me. And uh, the new leader, now they have a new leader, he was also selected, not because he was perfect, but despite the imperfections. But it is God giving me and you too the grace to abound in all good works. But you know, this good works can be translated into more than one way. If you read the previous verse, it's talking about giving. In other words, the work of giving. But if you read the two verses after, it's talking about righteousness, and that's why I bolded them. As it is written, he has dispersed the bride. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. Now, he that supplies seed to the soul, sower will both provide bread for your food and multiply your seed to sow and increase the fruits of your righteousness. There is something that God is more concerned about in us, and it is that we may be fruitful, that we may abound in fructifying. And part of fructifying is not just making our living, but that is secondary. The primary thing is, number one, his righteousness, and number two, his kingdom. So, uh, and Jesus explains that in a verse that didn't come up soon enough, but it's one that you guys know. It's Matthew 6.33, and it says, Seek ye first. 
the kingdom of God and in his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. So those are the two things. There are only two things that we can take to heaven. Those souls that God has given us to win for him and we pray and we hope for our own families and the good works that God has given us so that we may abound in righteousness. Those are the two things we can take to heaven. We can't take to heaven anything else. Just those two things. Um, by the way, talking about giving, our country is a giving country. I am amazed that whenever there is a disaster, whether it is in Afghanistan, or whether it is in Haiti, or whether it is in, I mean, there's all over the world things happening. America, by far, sends more than others. And one of the reasons is because of our religion. Even though a lot of people are no longer professing being Christians, they still believe in the God. And God commands us in his word that we shall give. Jesus lived giving, and he didn't care whether it was a foreigner or whether it was some of their own. So some of the Levites or the Pharisees, they could leave a man dying that was beaten on the road. But Jesus was like the Samaritan that came by and helped. And so that is a fruit of grace. I really think that that's, that's, that's good right there. And I believe there's going to be revival in this country. I think it's going to happen soon. But the revival starts in the church, first of all, among us. Definition of righteousness. These two quotes come from a Review and Herald article written by Alan G. White. It says, righteousness means being good and doing good. As children of God, we are developing a character. Are we developing a, a character that is Christ-like? And also, it's talking about where that righteousness comes from. Jesus loved righteousness and hated iniquity. What is righteousness? It is the satisfaction that Christ gave the divine law on our behalf. So Jesus took our place on the cross of Calvary, that all our defects were nailed, all our rebellions were nailed on the cross. But the Bible teaches us, this is another sermon, the Bible teaches us that Jesus didn't die just for our past. He died for our future, meaning he did not leave us as we are. Because it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So in other words, there's power in the blood to be transformed, not just forgiven. That's where it comes from. More comments about giving. Giving for the necessity of the saints. And these are comments about 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, the same passage we're dealing with. And for the advancement of the kingdom of God is preaching practical, practical sermons, which testify that those who give have not received the grace of God in vain. A living example of unselfish character, which is after the example of Christ, has great power upon men. So it's also talking about giving liberally. So this is good. Now I want to go over like the main points in this verse. The first point is God is able. God can do anything at all. I like that one passage that Ellen G. White says that we, too, can do anything by the grace of God, by His Holy Spirit. In one sense, of course it's a limited sense, we are omnipotent. 
but of course within bounds because it must be to glorify God. So if one day when the Holy Spirit is poured out, it is time to heal the sick. It is time to raise the dead. It is time to liberate the demon possessed. In fact, we don't have to wait. It can happen today. How do I know? My wife and I have helped several people to overcome demonic possession. And we've been successful every single time. Glory to God. This one woman, she came to our house with her husband. She had been taking some drugs prescribed to her because of postpartum depression. And these were, I think they call them SSRI or something like that type of drugs. But they are highly addictive. One of the side effects is suicide. And this woman was, in fact, in danger of killing her own baby, the baby girl, by the way. So, thank God, we were used by God, and she was liberated. But before she was liberated, the demon said through her mouth, I am in her blood, meaning the drug was circulating in her veins. So we began praying that her blood may be cleansed. She walked out not only rejoicing that she was free, but very happy. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. You know what? Some, sometimes we do have demons that also harass us. Maybe we're not demon possessed, but we have demons that harass us. We can have power over them by the blood of Jesus Christ. God is able to liberate us from all demonic oppression. God is able to liberate us and make us abound in grace. God is a God of grace. Now, grace has several meanings. I'll, I'll say two of these the, the meanings. One of them is the grace to overcome. The grace to have the strength. The grace to, I mean, it's like having patience. You're suffering, but you're having patience through that suffering. One of our professors at the university, he said that he had cancer. And his cancer was like very aggressive and it came to the point where he was suffering so much pain that he could hardly talk. He couldn't function. He was on the floor in pain. And he heard a voice that said, praise God. And he basically said, how? I'm in pain. And the voice says, praise God. So he just starts praising God and thanking God. He starts thanking God for his pain of all things. Amen. You know, the guy was healed from cancer, but he learned that the best thing to do when you are in pain, when you're suffering, is not to be complaining and grumbling and angry. It is let the grace abound by thanking God for His grace, for the problem, for the pain, for whatever crisis you're going through. So that was that was a special story. Never, never forget that one. Doesn't the Bible says in all things be thankful? Yes, even if you're dying. You know, 
it says also right here, always having all you need in all things. That is a promise. When you give, God gives to you. The Bible says, more blessed is he who gives and he who receives. It also says that in the measure you give, you shall receive. It also says that if you um, sow abundantly, you will re reap abundantly as well. So this is like a conditional promise. But God makes us a blessing when we bless others as well. So I am reminded of the story of this one man. He um, had his wood all ready for winter and it was really beginning to be really cold. And somebody comes by and says, can you share your wood? Uh, somebody got sick and I couldn't get my wood. And he gives them all the wood he had. And then, that was when he was at his store. Then he comes home and somebody had already replenished the wood and somebody else comes and has another story. He gives away all of his wood again. But God gives him again and he had wood. Now, you can imagine the wife was really, really upset because he had given away the wood twice now. But that same day, God gave him the wood. They didn't suffer any cold during that winter. Giving is actually receiving. You may abound to every good work. So that's the last part of this, this section. So God wants us to fructify in righteousness, in good works. I am praying to God for me, for God knows my defects. I'm praying for humility, and somebody said, don't pray for humility because God will really humiliate you. <laughs> I have to, I need it. I've asked others to pray for that for me as well. So when we get together, well, I'm no longer, I just, um, my last day was just last week as men's ministry leader for the Hispanic side of men's ministry. So I, um, I asked the people, I asked my leaders and I say, pray for me, I need humility. And they do. They take it seriously. So that's really good. God wants us to abound in every good work, whether it be humility or meekness or temperance or whether it be patience, loving, forgiving. I mean, forgiving is a hard one, at least for some of us. And every time a thought comes where sometimes, I don't know if this happened to you as well, you want to kill somebody. Why? Because somebody hurt you so bad. But you say, thank God, thank you God for the pain. I want to pray that you bless this person and may he or she be prospered. Now, it doesn't come natural for me. It doesn't come natural. One day, I was at home saying something like, may God bless the woman that hit and run and left thousands of dollars of damage in the car. The problem is I had a thousand dollar deductible. <laughs> so, um, may God bless the woman who hit and run. Never found her. I wish you'd have sent a thousand dollar check. <laughs> but you know what? The daughter heard me and says, What? What are you saying? Are you serious? I said, Yes. God bless the woman who hit and ran. That is abounding in every good work. 
I mean, Jesus prayed. Didn't he pray, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing? And he was suffering more. That's more than a thousand dollar damage right there. <clears throat> Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Parallel scripture to 2 Corinthians 9, 8 is Philippians 4, 19. But my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. The Philippians had sent a gift to Apostle Paul, and he was very happy, and he was making a promise. And this promise was recorded in scripture for us. It's a promise for us as well. What's the condition? Giving. So, we can't just read this verse and take it out of context and claim it. No. We need to fulfill our part as well. God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory. If we're robbing God by withholding tithes and offerings, how will he fulfill this promise right here? There's a huge promise if we are giving. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In conclusion, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 was written to thank the Corinthians of their financial pledge to give to the sower, the saints, preachers of the gospel, and to remind them that there is a huge blessing in giving. Paul makes a perfect mix of two things, financial blessings and blessings of righteousness. You know, it's not just one, it's not just another. There are some people who will spend a lot of time and energy trying to win souls, and that's good for them. There's other people who spend a lot of time and energy trying to get right with God, and that's also good. But they should be in combination. To make it work. That's why it's a perfect mix of two things right here. And those are the two things we're going to take to heaven. The souls that God gives us and the righteousness that God gives us as well. God is able. He's the omnipotent. Would you like to read this with me? This is a proclamation. God is able. He is the omnipotent. The almighty. The creator. He's the great I am. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the resurrection and the life. He's the omniscient and omnipresent God. He is able. God is the owner of all the gold and silver, the cattle on a thousand hills on all the earth. He is able to supply our needs. By the way, when it says, Cattle on a thousand hills, the translation today would be all the money on a thousand international banks. I don't know if there's that many, but that would be an equivalent. God has all the grace we need that we can abound in good works of righteousness. We have hope in our battle against sin. It is God's grace. Victory is ours. Now, I would like you to help me in this last proclamation. Would you be free from the burden of sin? Would you over evil a victory win? There is power, power, wonder-working power. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. In the name of God be glorified. We're going to sing that hymn now.